the DMAC. Whoops. That's what I get for not checking my schedule. Sorry. So stay for the DMAC and then stay quality committee for a little bit of time. We'll hurry it. How do I turn this off? Oh, can you edit that out? for the recording. Okay, it's already on. Yeah. Okay. And this is the right other one? Yeah, it wasn't on the... It was on the top. On the, on the desktop cam? But on the far left. Okay, you're fine. Okay. Turn it. If you turn it on, you'll know almost immediately because this has got a short in it on the one that's wrapped up. Oh, okay. We have some for Hey, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, good. Well, I've got two mics for you today. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm Mark Young, by the way. It's nice to meet you. Sorry, where, do you Brian. where do you want this? Uh, on your tie? <coughs> Sorry, I'm Brian Clark. Yeah, uh, CMEs. Is that good? Okay. Perfect. Okay. And on and off. Very, very simple. And who's shown that? On these. Uh, and I've done this multiple times, but I always forget on this audience response. If you can just pull me, just tell me, show me what I'm doing on this as far as this audience response. You click it once and it brings it up, right? And then you say, right, and then you click it again and then it'll show the results. It See. shows the vote. Yeah. Okay. This one's for the recording. So, okay. Over here. The other one on top. The other one. Um, pointer on this. Always forget that also. So most people. Hey, how are you? This is turning point, right? Um, what is turning point? Uh, oh, it is. Yes. Okay. It's, yes. <laughs> He, uh, I don't think he reset your slides. Okay. It's always going to go. Okay. It'll be forward, forwards and backwards. Okay. And the laser pointer. Okay. And laser pointer comes up on here or uh, up there. It's, it's, it's really but I direct Honestly, it. the mouse shows up a lot better in this room. Okay. So just take the mouse and go on it. Okay. All right. 
And then right, left click is forward, obviously, right? I think it is. Okay. Right. Or backward? I normally use the arrow keys for the uh, clicker. I've never actually used them. So just the clicker here? Yeah. Go forward. Okay. Let's just find out. Okay. Yep, it does. Left click does go forward. Okay, then. And that does too. Okay, okay then go like this. Does that go backwards? Okay, yeah, that's my first slide, right? Okay. Now, the again, the pointer was here, but the clicker, you said just use this, right? Okay. Yeah, okay, all right. And so click once, the question comes up. I just work here. Click once, the question, question comes up. Tell yeah. them to vote, and then click, click it. Yeah, and, and it closes it. Right. And then it shows the response. Okay, yeah. all right. Okay. All right, thank you. Hey, how are you? It's good to see you. I haven't seen you around. I saw you via that. He's at the, Starbucks. Yes. <laughs> Mainly Starbucks. <laughs> You ready? Everybody had a good break? All right. I'm uh, Mark Young from Gastroenterology, and I appreciate uh, the time given me today to speak about diseases of the liver, cirrhosis, and hopefully prevention of cirrhosis. The, I don't have any financial uh, conflicts or interests. Today what I'd like to do is talk about several different topics as it relates to the liver and the, one of those topics being non-alcoholic fatty liver disease which I think you'll see pretty much every week in your uh, clinic. Uh, the other topics we'd like to focus on is the magnitude of liver disease, some basic science research that's summarized just in a couple slides, some changes to the MELS score model for end-stage liver disease and also uh, use of proton pump inhibitor therapy and hopefully prevention of infections in your population. So uh, the last thing you need to see is a turkey looking at you at 12-12 after you've been sitting in here since 8 a.m. getting lectured to. But it is the holiday season, and this is kind of a theme of my lecture today is that with the holidays, there's a lot of old uh, traditions and routines that we follow and it's really the same way in liver disease, but there are many new things that have changed over the last 20 to 25 years uh, in the field of liver disease when I was a fellow that we're going to discuss today. So uh, traditionally what we've done at Thanksgiving is eat food, watch football, and now when you know, I talk to my friends and fellows about football, they're not so much interested in the outcomes of a specific game, but actually the outcome of their favorite fantasy football player, which I, I don't really follow. So just out of curiosity, uh, we wanted to know what you were going to do on Thanksgiving this Thursday, and you can respond to this with your uh, audience response system. The first would be on call at Mountain State's hospital. The second would be on call at the VA. The third would be watching football. The fourth would be eating and drinking too much. The next would be is we would like you to be studying for the ABIM, 
Uh, you could be sleeping, or you could spend your holiday like, like I'm going to Thursday with a bunch of relatives whose names, many of whom I don't know, that I never really see, and I don't claim any uh, genetic uh, relationship with them. So you all can vote on that. How are you going to spend your uh, holiday? So the polling's open. Everybody finished? So this is pretty good. 35% are going to be studying for the ABIM. I'm, I'm worried about that 35%. <laughs> I empath empathize with the 13% that are going to be in my situation. And uh, I really uh, respect the 4% that are going to be eating and drinking too much on that day. So thank you for your honesty right there. I appreciate it. Oh, okay, great. No one's studying. No one's studying. Oh, I, I, I like that more because I, my wife made me these progressive lenses and they don't always work really that well. So, but I, I respect your honesty. So my answer would be the, dealing with these non-biologic family members. So a lot of your patients and a lot of the house staff will ask, what is cirrhosis anyway? So if you wanted a definition of cirrhosis, that would be end-stage consequence of fibrosis of the hepatic parenchyma with architectural distortion, nodule formation, and stellate activation. Stellate activation is a central event in the development of cirrhosis, and that's something that we've really studied more over the last decade. The stellate cell used to be called etocells, and a stellate cell is very rich in retinoic acid, and it is highly involved in vitamin A metabolism. So those are kind of take-home messages about the current thought on the stellate cell. There was a recent um, article in gastroenterology, and they called it the, the star of the liver being the stellate cell. If you look at the left side of this cartoon, you'll see that it's, it's rich in vitamin A metabolism, retinoic acid. It really causes fibrosis and scarring in the liver when activated, and it can cause contractility and blood flow changes to the, uh, to the liver cells. On the right side of the, the cartoon, you'll see that uh, many investigators have recently studied the stellate st cell and shown that it's very important as an immunologic uh, mediator as far as antigen pre uh, presentation and actually protection against certain infections including, including listeria, and hepatitis B virus and hepatitis C virus along with malaria. They've also found that it's very instructive in T cell instruction. So it functions both as an immunologic cell and also within the liver when activated as a marker of fibrosis and a cause of fibrosis. So with fibrogenesis, what happens is there's an insult to the liver, the hepatocyte, and this causes activation of this hepatic stellate cell and it turns into a myofibroblast. After it turns into a myofibroblast, it lays down a matrix of fibrosis, and with different proteases, it can either be inhibited or it can continue. And this can result in fibrosis resolution, or it can result in apoptosis, which is cell death, or a quiescent state in the liver. So what different investigators are doing is they're trying to find ways to work on this pathway here with deactivation to halt fibrosis of the liver. There's a lot of stem cell research going on with the liver now, and just to summarize in this cartoon, with any hepatic injury in different mouse cell lines, you can have proliferation and self-renewal of those cell lines of the liver. If you have fulminant hepatic failure, such as in acetaminophen hepatotoxicity, it's been shown in cell lines that cholangiocytes can actually differentiate from progenitor cells to hepatocytes, and if you have chronic biliary injury, such as uh, natrofurantoin toxicity to the liver, you can have transdifferentiation where hepatocytes turn into cholangiocytes. Locally, Dr. Peterson, Dr. Mormon, and Dr. Yao have studied the liver probably over the last seven to eight years. And Dr. Mormon and Dr. Yao have looked at the immunologic mechanisms of hepatitis C infection. Dr. Peterson more recently has studied the CTRP3 um, protein, which is a lysozyme, and what, he sh what, what they've shown is that there's de decreased gluconeogenesis in the liver, so it may be a target for metabolic syndrome. 
It also affects blood monocytes with decreased inflammation. And more importantly, in adipose tissue, there's, it's been shown that there's decreased adipogenesis and decreased inflammation. So Dr. Peterson has already studied certain patients that have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and using this CTRP3 as a mediator. And more recently, he's, developed, he's started a protocol to study patients with alcoholic hepatitis. So locally, there's a lot of research going on with fat in the liver and inflammation in the liver through these investigators. If you look at this cartoon, I think it's always good to step back and look at you know, how the liver's supposed to look. So with this cartoon, there's a central vein here and a portal triad there. This is what you want your liver to look at, to look like. These are very nice, very healthy hepatocytes. And as the fellows could tell you, this is a vein, this is an arteriole with, a very, with that smooth intimal lining, and this is a bile ductal. And you'll notice this interface here between this triad and the liver parenchyma is very clean. There's no inflammatory cells, there's no fibrosis, and there's no markers of inflammation. So how do we diagnose someone that has cirrhosis or, uh, or F4 fibrosis? Well, you can look at it histologically under the microscope. You can look at it by imaging. And as we all know, you'll see a shrunken liver with a large spleen size. And then serologically, tip-offs when you see somebody in your clinic this afternoon, the bilirubin may be high, the albumin may be low, the synthetic function, the platelets may be low, the white count low, and the INR high. Obviously, the platelets and white count being low because of possible splenomegaly with the INR being high because of decreased synthetic function of the liver. I spent a lot of my uh, earlier years in gastroenterology studying different ways that the liver could be biopsied. And many years ago, we did studies looking at a true cut needle biopsy that was actually used for prostate cancer, and the urologists were using it. And we found that that had better core samples than the old Jim Shibi needles. But nowadays, we really don't do very many liver biopsies. The main reason for doing liver biopsy now is if you have someone with metastatic disease to the liver that you want to prove that they have malignancy. We don't really do liver biopsies anymore to evaluate for fibrosis of the liver. There's better ways of doing it. I will say that if you have a patient that has chronic inflammation of the liver from fatty liver or any other cause, and they're going to the operating room to have their gallbladder removed for any reason, that one should consider doing a laparoscopic guided liver biopsy when they're in the, in the abdomen at that time. So if you look at the evolution of fibrosis uh, in someone, it starts out with F0, which is no fibrosis in the liver, and pro progresses to this nodular liver um, on the far right of the screen, which would be an F4 lesion. You can see in this evolution, which happens over decades in someone that has non-alcoholic fatty liver, the trichrome stain shows this blue staining of the uh, fibrin around the portal triad, and it starts to bridge and advance to another portal triad. And finally, you get the irreversible, most would think irreversible cirrhosis as an end stage sequelae. If you look at it in imaging studies, you know, a lot of the imaging studies you'll order on your obese patients or patients with chronic liver disease, they'll describe this heterogeneous appearance of the liver, which you'll see this uh, 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 heterogeneous appearing liver. You'll also see a nodular appearance on the side of the liver. And on CT scan, you can often see a shrunken left lobe of the liver with ascites present and a very large spleen here, which is shown, and these are actually gastric varices shown at the bottom. So the, really the best way as we speak today to evaluate for fibrosis of the liver would be either serologically or with ultrasound elasto elastography. I think at the VA they're trying to get a machine that's an ultrasound elast elastograph, and also it's being considered in the private practice. There's presently one of the fellows that I, or residents that I trained that went on to do a fellowship is practicing in Asheville, and we have sent some patients over to Asheville for ultrasound elastography. This is a simple procedure. The patient lies on their side, the examiner takes the ultrasound wand and presses it against the liver and shoots sound waves against the liver, and by that it gives you a reading on how elastic or how stiff the liver is. And as you'll see in one of my next slides, it has a very high correlation with liver fibrosis and liver cirrhosis. There's also a multitude of serologic testing you can order in your office. This is called a, uh, uh, a LabCorp result uh, with a, a fibro score, and it takes different blood, blood tests from the patient, puts it together, and it reads out a score of F0 to F4 
telling you the degree of fibrosis that they have in the liver. And this is actually a very accurate way to look for fibrosis in the liver. The reason that this is more important now is with hepatitis C treatment, certain, I think everybody ought to be treated for hepatitis C if that's their preference, but certain insurances want evidence that there's fibrosis on a, a liver biopsy or a fibro score to approve the medication for hepatitis C. So we order a lot of these, this blood work for evaluation of hepatitis C. You can see in this uh, summary of different studies that have looked at fibro scores and also uh, elastography, uh, that all of, these all of these serologic tests and all of the, the uh, uh, fibro scan scores are very good, so they're outstanding ways to survey for fibrosis of the liver. And as we speak now, non-invasive imaging has replaced serologic testing as a way to look for uh, scarring or fibrosis in the liver. So the next question would be, in the near future, the most common cause of cirrhosis in your internal medicine practice will be HCV cirrhosis, alcohol cirrhosis, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, metabolic disease, or untreated hepatitis B. So most people feel like it's non-alcoholic uh, liver disease, and that's actually the right, correct answer. As we speak today, there's, there's a great treatment for hepatitis C, and within the next couple years, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease will be the number one indication for liver transplant in the United States. Now, we now have a greater than 90% cure rate for hepatitis C. Who should be screened in your internal medicine practice for this disease? Anyone born between 1945 and 1965? Those that received hemodialysis treatments, all HIV-infected persons, children born to HCV-infected mothers, or all of the above. So most people feel all of the above, and I would, I would think that uh, I would agree with you. All of those patients need to be uh, screened. Two recent natural history studies indicated the best predictor for all-cause mortality in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease patients was their BMI, obesity, age, type 2 diabetes, or liver fibrosis. Most people feel it's liver fibrosis, and I might have prejudiced you, you know, from the first 20 slides that we had, but I would agree with you, it is liver fibrosis. And this was from a retrospective large uh, Swedish study that was published in Lancet recently. This is a typical picture of non-alcoholic um, fatty liver, macrovesicular fat crowding out the normal liver parenchyma with these large fat globlets uh, spread out throughout the liver. This is one of my favorite slides. I'm proud of this slide because I've gone to different lectures uh, at different uh, meetings and I've heard hepatologists allude to the sequence of events in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and then also NASH. But I think this slide summarizes it nicely. So if you have somebody when you go back to the VA today or back to, to uh, ETSU physicians for your clinic and you see fat on an ultrasound and they say to you, doctor, what's my chance of having trouble in the liver in the future from all this fat that I have in my liver. So if it's simple non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, you can tell them that greater than 80% of the time, there's just going to be isolated fat in the liver and you're going to have a benign course. You can also tell them that less than 20% of the time, you're going to develop NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis with an inflamed liver. This is about 5% of all Americans. So your patient asks, all right, doctor, I have NASH. What are my chances of developing cirrhosis? And you could actually tell them they have about a 30% chance of developing cirrhosis, which is about 2% of all Americans. And once they have cirrhosis, unfortunately, they have about a 1% annual instance of developing hepatocellular carcinoma. So you can see if there's anything that we can step in in any of these areas to prevent this cascade, that would be very efficacious for the patient. The summaries on NAFL include outcomes depend on regeneration of the liver. As I said before, two large natural history studies have shown that the only predictor of all-cause mortality has been liver fibrosis. And age and severity of inflammation predict fibrosis in the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease patient. So we pulled this group of esteemed physicians 
and we asked them, how would you treat non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? This internist said lifestyle modification. This internist said, what about vitamin E therapy? This cardiologist said he didn't really care. He wanted the heart protected at all costs. <laughs> this bariatric surgeon, Dr. Scott Watson, said you'd obviously take him to the OR and do a gastric bypass. And Dr. Stewart said, you really need to control the blood sugar. These medical students said, what about some coffee and a social drink every day? And Dr. Light just wanted to do a punch biopsy. I'm not quite sure why he wanted to do a punch biopsy, but he wanted to do a punch biopsy. So if you look at non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and cardiovascular risk, all these are non-liver associated risk factors for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. They have impaired fibrinolytesis, they have obesity, type 2 diabetes, atherogenic dyslipidemia, metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, increased uric acid, chronic kidney disease, increased homocysteine levels, decreased vitamin D. So you can see there's a myriad of problems associated with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease by just fat in the liver. This is in publication at present, but for the internists in the audience and those residents that aren't, that aren't uh, GI-specific people, like we are, if you see somebody in your practice and you have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, these are some things that you should think about. This, I think this is a great flow diagram. So you have a patient with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease with no cardiovascular events. If they're a diabetic, then you obviously want to do lifestyle changes with tailor, tailored drug treatment to decrease their cardiovascular risk factors. If they're not a diabetic, you fall into the Framingham study guidelines. And if they have low risk by the Framingham study guidelines, less than 10% in 10 years, you go to lifestyle changes and follow up. If they have high risk, greater than 15% at 10 years, then you would consider doing some other imaging studies, maybe carotid ultrasound, maybe echocardiography, and then do intensive statin therapy for that patient. And if they're intermediate risk, you would try to treat them with lifestyle modification. And if they, they fail this, you may do some other imaging, and then they flip back over into the high risk area with intensive statin use. So you can kind of kind of judge this, this is one person's aspect of how they think they ought to be treated. You could spend 60 minutes and talk about the different studies and the different treatments for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. But I've tried to summarize all these treatments into one slide. So the treatment for NAFL and NASH, lifestyle and surgery improves NASH, but it has much less benefit on fibrosis. So as we said before, these studies are indicating that fibrosis is the hallmark that you have to stop to prevent cirrhosis. We used to use vitamin E a whole lot about eight to 10 years ago. I was writing vitamin E for everybody. It, and, but what it's now been shown as is vitamin E improves ballooning in non-diabetics, but there's probably a risk of increased chance of prostate cancer and all-cause mortality in these patients. So it's been a long time since I've written a prescription for vitamin E. There's an FXR agonist, a beta colic acid, and, and this is basically a bile acid receptor. So what this medication does is, is um, promotes, promotes this receptor to, to, to increase its activity. What's been shown with that is it improves liver fibrosis, but it actively increased serum cholesterol and insulin resistance. And this was published in Lancet, and this was in the Flint trial by this large conglomeration of investigators that study non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Now there's also trials going on for this same FXR agonist for primary sclerosis and cholangitis and primary biliary cirrhosis also. Pioglitazone, we used to write a lot of scripts for pioglitazone. Pioglitazone leads to weight gain, increased risk of congestive heart failure, and it doesn't convincingly reverse fibrosis. And there's been studies looking at coffee and social alcohol and it actually reduced fibrosis in a few cross-sectional studies. So again, you could spend 60 minutes just on these studies, but if you boil it all down, that's what it shows. Now there's an investigator at Duke, Dr. Anna Mae Dill, that spent her uh, a very distinguished career studying non-alcoholic fatty liver, liver disease and obesity, leptin deficiency um, in rats. And recently, based on some of her work, it's been shown that if you transfer the fecal flora from one mouse to another, you can not only induce obesity in that mouse, but you can either give them the trait for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or take that trait away. So you can take this mouse and turn him into that mouse, not by feeding him pizza, but by taking the fecal flora of this mouse 
and sticking it in that mouse. So the fecal flora is hot in just about every disease process that, that we know. So in my practice, or when you go back to the clinic today, in good faith, what you can tell your patients is to encourage healthy eating habits and exercise, enlist the help of dietitians and trainers, limit alcohol, follow your patients closely clinically and serologically. I don't tell my patients that they just have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and never see them again. Even though there's not a whole lot I can do about it, they have to do it for themselves. I think a motivational talk every year or two doesn't hurt. Use non-invasive markers of fibrosis and utilization of clinical trials at other centers depending on the family's wishes. So I do have some patients, actually a twin, whose twin sister's in a study at Duke, and you know she's gone over there. So there are other centers looking at some of these uh, other agents. What do you tell your patients on how to avoid seeing your local doctor about liver problems? So just generalities that you can tell your patients. Exercise, modest alcohol, control lipids, cholesterol, blood sugar, avoid risk factors for viral hepatitis, have immunizations for hepatitis A and B, avoid hepatotoxic drugs and test for hepatitis C. So you really want to uh, live like Dr. Pranav Patel lives. Just say, look at Dr. Patel and live like him and you'll be okay. Who should we, who should we screen for hepatitis C with a high prevalence group? Those that, uh, whoever injected illegal drugs. And I think, again, a take home message, I know most of y'all know this, but a lot of the medical students that come on service, we ask what are the risk factors for hepatitis C and they're aware of IV drug use and they're aware of blood transfusions before 1990, but they're really not aware of nasal cocaine use. So the NIH consensus study really says that, that nasal cocaine use is, is, is the number one risk factor as far as illicit drug use for transmission of hepatitis C. And as you can imagine, uh, patients that use hepatitis C have a lot of uh, uh, bleeding and, and uh, uh, constriction of their blood vessels in their nose. So if you share an applicator, from one person to another, that person gets the blood from the applicator of the first person, and that's how they transmit the hepatitis C. Patients on hemodialysis, uh, a recipient clotting factor before 1987, and a recipient transfusion for organ transplant before 1992, high HCV prevalence, including inmates and STD clinics, and HIV infected patients. If, God forbid, you know, we get stuck by a needle this afternoon, who, who do we survey? Well, percutaneous or heavy mucosal exposure to HCV, children born to HCV infected uh, women. Sexual transmission is a very poor way to transmit hepatitis C. If, when AIDS originally came about, you could see when the AIDS epidemic rose, hepatitis B transmission rose with the AIDS epidemic, but hepatitis C stayed flat. So even years ago, they knew that because patients that had AIDS had higher risk for hepatitis B but just by sexual transmission, they were totally flat for hepatitis C. So it's a pretty poor way to transmit hepatitis C. So your next question is a 42-year-old male with a past history of hepatitis C and heavy alcohol use presents to the ED with massive hematemesis. He was told he had cirrhosis by his family doctor one year ago. Medications which should be started in the ED include ceftriaxone two grams a day for five days, atriotide 50 microgram bolus followed by 50 mics per hour, IV erythromycin, 250 milligrams, 30 minutes before endoscopy, or all of the above? Okay, most people feel all of the above and I would say that the correct answer is all of the above. Endoscopic first-line therapy would include which of the above in this patient? So endoscopically, how are you going to treat this patient? Okay, most everybody wants to go for esophageal band ligation, which uh, I would agree. And you have a time capsule, and uh, it's available. You can go back in time before this patient ever had uh, any problems. Primary prophylaxis in patients with medium to large varices with decompensated disease include either non-selective beta blockers or esophageal band ligation. Is that true or false?
I always like true and false questions. I figure I have a 50-50 chance, Ryan. Okay, most people believe that's true, and I would think that that is true. Gastric varices are usually seen in the fundus of the stomach. We have really no great endoscopic therapy for gastric varices. Some centers use glue. Uh, besides the tips, uh, band ligation doesn't help. Sclerotherapy doesn't help. Uh, prophylaxis of varices, there's no evidence to, uh, to this day that if you have a cirrhotic patient, if you place them on beta blockers, that that is going to prevent formation of esophageal varices. So there is no evidence for pre-primary prophylaxis of varices. Now, primary prophylaxis of small varices would give you a lower risk of bleeding compared to large, 7% to 15% over two years. They may be used to prevent growth in size, uh, used in, in decompensated disease or stigmata of bleeding. Those with medium to large varices are the ones that you really want to prophylax with beta blockers. If they're intolerant to beta blockers, uh, with fatigue or blood sugar problems, or if they have e evidence of ascites, which is difficult to control, then you would go on to band ligation. And in some patients, you could use beta blockers and band ligation, both. Esophageal varices are, are veins in the esophagus, which are prominent. This is a, a bleeding site from an esophageal varix. This is an active bleeding varix with spurting of blood across the lumen. This is a uh, band ligator, and this is the present way that we treat esophageal varices. A rubber band's put on the end of this, it's backloaded into the scope, and you suck the varix up into the scope, you click the, you click the applicator, and the rubber band pops onto the varix and strangulates it. This was actually uh, st uh, invented by a gentleman named Stegman and Goff that were surgeons, and they used this for application of internal hemorrhoids, and it's really the same applicator. You can see on our op notes, and we, when we say there were seven bands placed or six bands placed, this is a polyp which has uh, uh, developed from the rubber band that is strangulating the varicel channel. So once patients have these, these uh, polyps from the bands placed, that you shouldn't put a nasogastric tube down because you can tell a nasogastric tube could go through one of the var varicel polyps and shear it and cause more bleeding. This is a TIPS procedure. This is from the portal to the hepatic vein, and interventional radiology does that in our refractory bleeders, and that also decompresses portal hypertension. And there's some studies looking at wall stents that we use for palliation of esophageal malignancy if, if they fail the esophageal varicel ligation and they're just actively bleeding out and you don't have access to a Blakemore tube. You know, I think we probably put in one Blakemore tube in the last three or four years here at the medical center. Uh, some studies are looking at these wall stents uh, to help uh, stop bleeding, but that's not something that's very commonly, uh, tom commonly done. Uh, Dr. Brombot had a patient that, you know, most of the time we're successful. And yeah, tell him about what you did on that, what what'd you use on, on your patient? Okay. Right. So he's writing it up, and if factor seven has been used, uh, has been cited as, a, as an agent that you can give patients that have active varicel bleeding that don't respond. And he actually came up with that idea. It was a gentleman in the unit that had massive bleeding. We put a zillion bands on him. He had this, he had that, and he was basically exsanguinating. And uh, Dr. Brombot started this, and he actually made it to Vanderbilt for a uh, tips and is alive today and doing well. Um, I spent a lot of time looking at ulcerations in, in, in band ligation, varicel ligation, compared to sclerotherapy. These are these bands being extruded after they're put on a varicel channel. These extrude over a period of about 14 days. And in this study, we looked at varicel sclerotherapy. And what we found was, if you take a patient that has bleeding varices or any varices, if you, if you do three to four sessions separated by about 14 days, the majority of people get rid of these varices. We also found that there wasn't really any evidence of stricture formation like there was in patients that had sclerotherapy. And the risk of bacteremia as opposed to sclerotherapy uh, is extremely small in band ligation. So we use band ligation uh, today. The other thing that I know all of you are aware of is the transfusion requirements for somebody that has gastrointestinal bleeding. We now have more of a restrictive transfusion policy based on this Barcelona study to less than seven grams per deciliter. Higher survival rates and less re-bleeding in peptic ulcer disease and child AMB cirrhotics have been seen. If you have a child C cirrhotic, uh, most people would still recommend, based on this Barcelona study, to transfuse to nine grams per day. I think antibiotics and GI bleeding and cirrhotics is one of the most common things that we see 
especially on the non-university services that we tweak a little bit when we see a patient. If you have somebody uh, that is a cirrhotic, there's a high risk of bacterial infections and up to 40% in cirrhotics within the first week of a variceal bleed. So if you have somebody that comes in with cirrhosis and bleeding, they should be given ceftriaxone two grams per day uh, or oral nerfloxacin 400 BID to prevent infections after variceal bleeding. Antibiotic prophylaxis should be instituted as soon as possible and followed and, 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 and continued for at least five days. Uh, I think we all know that octreotide works well in esophageal variceal bleeding. If you're in, working in the emergency room tonight and somebody comes in with a variceal bleed, the first thing you ought to do is bolus them with a 50 microgram bolus of octreotide followed by, I, I use 50 mics, uh, some people use 25 mics per hour. Any cirrhotic patient that comes in with that ought to be started on octreotide. And there's really no ill effect of that. If they have an ulcer instead of a variceal bleed, it can always be stopped. Uh, this is an algorithm for our treatment, which would be antibiotics uh, when you have suspected variceal bleeding, volume resuscitation, endoscopy, if you control bleeding, uh, continue them on the octreotide and start secondary prophylaxis, which would be a beta blocker. If you fail, you can take another shot at it. If you fail that, they probably need to go to the TIPS procedure, which I mentioned. Uh, a 50-year-old male developed increasing abdominal pain. An imaging test was performed. He has a long history of hepatitis C and alcoholism. Prior initiatives to prevent this lesion or detect it earlier would include, and I know what you're saying, you're saying, Dr. Young, there's no imaging study there, which I realized, but I didn't want to uh, insert it. I, th I thought it would kind of squirrely up things. So if you had an imaging study, what the imaging study would show would be a lesion in the liver, which is three centimeters in size, that on our arterial phase enhances very quickly and has a washout on the venous phase. So there's a lesion in the liver in this gentleman that has a long history of alcoholism and hepatitis C. So what could have been done to help prevent this lesion in the liver? Eradication of hepatitis C, imaging every six months, and alpha fetoprotein every six months, or discontinuation of alcohol, or all of the above. All right, very good. We got 100%, so uh, that's outstanding that y'all know that. So the answer is all of the above. So this is an hepatocellular carcinoma. And again, take home messages today is any cirrhotic liver needs to be followed for hepatocellular carcinoma. Big risk factors are hepatitis B, hepatitis C, but any cirrhotic, any cirrhotic, no matter if it's secondary to fat or hepatitis, needs to be followed. There's multiple other miscellaneous factors uh, that go along with it, but again, any cirrhotic liver needs to be followed. Dr. Payne at the VA does a beautiful job of explaining this on radiology conference on Mondays, but if you take a non-contrasted study, the liver looks normal. In the arterial phase, the lesion lights up. In the portal phase, it diminishes, and then on delayed studies, you can also see that it's there. So these are very vascular lesions, and they light up very quickly because of all the vascular flow. It's the fifth most common malignancy in women, the eighth most common malignancy, I'm sorry, fifth most common malignancy in men, eighth most common malignancy in women. There's been an increasing incidence in the past three decades, and patients need Q6 month screening intervals if they have cirrhosis to screen for hepatitis C. Now the imaging studies that you would use, I typically rotate an ultrasound of the abdomen with an, either an MRI or a, or a CT scan every six months. And, and on one of those studies. Alpha fetoprotein levels, the current guidelines say that you really don't need to, to uh, obtain an alpha fetoprotein every six months, but it's not wrong to do that. So this is just a reference slide of hepatocellular carcinoma, and the reason I put this in is that you don't biopsy hepatocellular carcinoma anymore. If you have a lesion that has that characteristic finding on imaging study and it's less than two centimeters, then they can go for a resection. If you have three lesions less than three centimeters or one less than five centimeters, there's been a lot of therapy that the interventional radiologists are doing as far as taste therapy, microwave therapy, to try to shrink the size of these lesions before they go on to liver transplantation. But the take home message of this slide is if you have that classic appearance on CT scan of hepatocellular carcinoma, then you do not need to do a liver biopsy on that patient. You really have your diagnosis. Just a little bit on hepatic encephalopathy. If you have hepatic encephalopathy, I think a great definition is brain dysfunction caused by liver insufficiency 
uh, as it manifests a wide spectrum of neurologic or psychiatric abnormality, abnormalities ranging from subclinical alterations to coma. Now the epidemiology is related to the underlying liver disease with portal systemic shunning. If you have somebody with one of these three uh, things that have developed, variceal bleeding, ascites, or hepatic encephalopathy, that defines decompensation in their liver disease. So if you see these consults that the fellows do and they say they have decompensated liver disease, decompensation is defined by either a variceal bleed, ascites, or hepatic encephalopathy. Now you all know the clinical uh, sequelae of um, hepatic encephalopathy. They have psychomotor retardation, apathy, irritability, disinhibition, coma, asterixis, rhythmic uh, squeeze to the examiner's fingers. So Dara, can you step up here? A second. So I know you all know how to check for hepatic encephalopathy, but sometimes when the students come through, uh, they really don't know how to check. So if you have the patient put their arm up here, both arms up like this, wrist back, we're going to press back on her hands, and we're going to tell her to hold it there. So hold it there, and with no encephalopathy, okay? This is one of the clearest days I've seen Dar at work. She's just, there's no tremulous, there's nothing. All right, so, so give me a tremulous with an alcoholic that's withdrawing. Okay. Okay, so, so tremulous would be just some shaking and quivering and stuff like that. That's not asterisks. All right, give me a good asterisk here, okay? okay. We're going to put, she blew the spot on that. So give me a good asterisk. So we're holding her wrist back hard, actually, and we're saying, hold it there. Okay, so a true asterisk flap would be it goes forward and it flaps back like that, right? So this is tremulous holding the wrist back like this. They try to hold it, they try to hold it, and then it flaps back. Now the other thing about hepatic encephalopathy is you can actually do it with, if, it's, if, you, if you tell them, if you put your finger out and you say, hold my finger, and squeeze as hard as you can. What happens is they'll squeeze, but then rhythmically they'll let go and squeeze hard again, rhythmically squeeze hard again, and rhythmically squeeze hard again. So you can do it with the eyelashes coming down, you can do it on fingers, or you can do it on hands coming back. Thank you. So how many of y'all like blood ammonia levels? How many of y'all order blood ammonia levels? I know you think there's a firing squad behind the wall back there or something if you say yes, but uh, there's really no role for serum ammonia levels in hepatic encephalopathy. And a lot of people order the you know, serum ammonia levels, but there's really no role. It's a very nonspecific test. It's not an accurate test. And hepatic encephalopathy is a clinical diagnosis. Now, there's been, you can do neurophysiologic and psychomotor testing, but there's actually been an app, you know, for your cell phone that's been developed called a Stroop test. And it's actually test motor function, you know, if you want to get into something fancier besides just saying connect the stars or, or you don't like asterixis, and I personally haven't used it, but put it in there. So th there's, there's treatments for refractory encephalopathy, which include branched-chained amino acids, leucine, isoleucine, valine. Daily protein intake should be 1.2 to 1.5 grams a day. But the primary treatment would be get rid of any offending sedative hypnotic agents along with uh, lactulose. And what we do, as you know, is we usually start out with a dose of lactulose at 30 cc's, Q6 hours, and we want to titrate it to one to two loose stools per day. If that fails or the patient just doesn't like having the diarrhea, which I wouldn't either, you can use rifaximine at a dose of 550 milligrams twice a day. So rifaximine can be used with lactulose as first-line therapy and if that fails, you can look at the other studies. Now, I don't like going over guidelines because they're, they're kind of boring to go over. But if you want to look at guidelines for ascites, you could go back to this article in 2009 by Dr. Runyon, and these are probably going to be updated pretty soon. It's the most common complication of cirrhosis. I think you ought to know this number. 50% of cirrhotic patients will develop ascites within two years of diagnosis. Once you develop ascites, uh, 50 there's a 50% mortality within two years. So once you develop ascites, again, that's a sign of decompensated liver disease. The pathophysiology of ascites is increased nitric oxide production, which is a potent vasodilator, which causes renal sodium retention with overfill of the intravascular volume, ascites formation, with increased sympathetic nervous activity with renin and aldosterone. So it's basically due to the effects of nitrous oxide, a potent vasodilator. I know everybody in here is probably familiar with the 
the SAG, the serum albumin gradient, but you ought to be familiar with it. That's the serum albumin minus the acidic albumin. If you take the serum albumin minus the acidic albumin, that's a direct measure of oncotic pressures from Starling's laws. So it's a direct indication of portal hypertension. If you look at the causes of cirrhosis, most patients' causes of cirrhosis, ascites, most come from cirrhosis. Cardiac disease, peritoneal carcinomatosis can also do it. If you look at high gradient, greater than 1.1 measures on the albumin gradient, cirrhosis is the number one cause of that, portal hypertension. If you look at these low gradients, less than 1.1, the thing that we most often see, unfortunately, is malignancy. Uh, peritoneal carcinomatosis can do it. Different infections like TB can do it. This is a flow chart for fluid analysis. Now, the, the thing that I put on here that I think is really helpful, and I think most of y'all already know, is that if you do a tap on somebody and they have an albumin gradient greater than 1.1, that certainly indicates that they have portal hypertension. The only other differential of that would be uh, uh, cardiac cirrhosis. So that is one, in the, one area that you can check a total protein. So if you have a total protein in your acidic fluid that's 2.5 or greater, that goes along with cardiac cirrhosis as opposed to a primary cause in the liver. You can also look at total protein being less than one gram as a marker for spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. So you can get a lot of information from an albumin gradient. Now we're finishing up with the role of antibiotics and albumin in the, for SBP. If you do have somebody that has SBP defined by greater than 250 absolute white blood cell count on an acidic tap, the treatment is ceph cefotaxime, two grams Q8 hours for 10 to 14 days. You have renal impairment in these patients and about 33% of these patients, so they ought to be given albumin 1.5 grams per kilogram at the time of diagnosis and a gram per kilogram on day three. This decreases the systemic vasodilatation, and if you don't want to use cefotaxime, oral ofloxacin can be used. Now, the other thing in ascites, a lot of reasons people die from ascites is because of infection in the acidic fluid. There are certain risk factors for infection, and that would include a previous esophageal variceal bleed, previous episode of SBP, and as I said before, an ascites protein less than one gram per deciliter. These patients ought to be prophylaxed with norfloxacin. As far as diuresis, this is a typo. It's not 400 milligrams per day of, of, uh, of uh, ferrosamine. It's 160 milligrams per day. I apologize for that. But the way that we treat ascites is a little bit different than it was several years ago. The, the doses of medications that we start out with typically are 100 milligrams of aldactone and 40 milligrams of Lasix taken together. So I also oftentimes see patients in our clinic that come in with these split doses of aldactone. There's no reason to do that. You can start out with 100 of that and 40 of the furosemide. If, the, if uh, side effects of aldactone include uh, gynecomastia and breast tenderness in males, if they have that, you could use ameliorite 10 milligrams a day. You can advance up to 400 milligrams of aldactone and 160 milligrams of, uh, of uh, furosemide, that would be your highest, and you ought to sodium restrict these patients to less than two grams, two, mil two grams per day of sodium. I don't beat my patients up a whole lot about fluid intake. I don't want them drinking free water all day. I don't want them drinking different things all day, but they're in a miserable situation, so I think you know, the main key that you can take home that they will do is try to restrict their sodium content. Finishing up with infections, and a little bit on the mail, just about five more minutes, uh, in non cirrhotic patients, what we see are these types of infections. We see UTIs in our cirrhotic patients, but we see more evidence of C. diff infection and spontaneous bloodstream infections in our cirrhotic patients. All these studies have looked at uh, the risk of infection in patients with cirrhosis and the use of proton uh, pump inhibitor therapy. So 50 to 70 percent of cirrhotics are on proton pump inhibitor therapy for non-recommended reasons. And as you know, proton pump inhibitors are an independent risk factor for uh, Clostridia difficile infection. So if you take a cirrhotic patient who's already at increased risk for Clostridia difficile, and then you put them on a proton pump inhibitor that further increases the risk of C. diff, then you got a patient real quick that has C. diff. So even the short-term use of PPIs alters the fecal flora. So you really need to look and see why patients are on the agent, and obviously if they don't need to be on the PPI, they need to be discontinued. MELD is a model for end-stage liver disease, and I know you all know how to do this, but all you have to do is take the serum bilirubin, the INR, and the creatinine, 
and go to the mail website. It'll give you an algorithmic calculation for this. And this is an example. This meld was 21. This is a nice slide showing that the higher your MEL score, the greater your risk of death on the wait list for a liver transplant. Most of our patients get sent for transplant evaluation around 14 to 15 MEL. When they get to the low 20s to the mid 20s, most of these patients hopefully have a liver by then. Now, the indications for a transplant would be hepatic failure, hepatorenal syndrome, ascites, hepatocellular carcinoma, encephalopathy, and bleeding from portal hypertension, as we already went over the hepatocellular um, cancer slide. But the thing that is changing with the MEL score is, is, are these exception points. So uh, many patients with hepatocellular carcinoma are given extra points for having hepatocellular carcinoma so they can be transplanted early. And there was a recent study in gastroenterology that looked at the mean transplanted score for an hepatocellular patient that was 13.3, and the mean transplanted score for a, a non-HCC patient was 21.8. So the new proposal is to cap the HCC score at 34 because the HCC patients have been getting an unfair advantage as far as transplant. The final thing I'll say about the MEL and the final thing I'll say in this lecture is the other change that's going to come to the MEL very soon is going to be the sodium. So we've always known that the sodium is a very strong predictor of poor outcomes in patients with cirrhosis and chronic liver disease. So they're coming up with an addition to this formula showing that the relative risk of death is very high in these hyponatremic patients. And what they're going to do is add sodium on to this MEL score where if you take a patient that had a sodium of 136 and 125, you could see that it would push their score up to a meld of 30, getting them a transplant slightly quicker. So the two points to the meld score that are going to change are hepatocellular carcinoma, CATS being enforced to eliminate an unfair advantage, and also incorporating the serum sodium score. So the final two slides just summarizes what we've talked about in the last 45 minutes, and that is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease will soon surpass hepatitis C as a leading cause of liver-related mortality. The jury is still out on most therapies for NASH, and future research will be directed at halting fibrogenesis. We want to screen appropriate patients for hepatitis C and treat. We want serologic testing and transient elastography to replace liver biopsy for evaluation of fibrosis. Our triotide and band ligation are mainstays of treatment for varicel bleeding. Primary prophylaxis for varices depends on varicel size. Image your cirrhotic patients every six months to screen for hepatocellular carcinoma. Serum ammonia levels have no role in diagnosis and management of hepatic encephalopathy. Calculate a SAG gradient in your patients with ascites. Review all meds closely in your cirrhotic patients, including PPIs to help prevent infection. And changes are coming to the mail to incorporate sodium and a cap exception points for hepatocellular carcinoma. And I hope you all have a good break. Are there any questions? Or? Yes, sir. I think uh, I think SB is probably decreased renal perfusion. You know, is what I would I would think. And I think in um, uh, if. I think with SVP, I think with difficult to control ascites, you know, I'd take them off the beta blocker and I would try to eradicate solely with band ligation because that's a good test. And I think if you look at it, it's probably because of decreased perfusion, I would think. Anybody else? So, what is the incidence yeah. of um, hepatocellular carcinoma in patients with NA who have no fibrosis or minimal fibrosis? He, uh, the question was, what are the, what's the incidence of somebody that has no cirrhosis and minimal fibrosis or minimal fibrosis? Or minimal fibrosis. If, if they have hepatitis C as a cause or hepatitis B, it's an independent risk factor for hepatocellular carcinoma, okay, whether they have fibrosis or not. If they don't have cirrhosis, it would be a very minimal risk factor until they develop it. Cirrhosis. So, if their primary problem is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, it's probably not a risk factor. Okay. There are some case reports, you know, that they have. Right. There's case reports with Hep C. There's case reports with Hep B. But but the high majority of people that have hepatocellular carcinoma comes out of a cirrhotic liver, 
they either have cirrhosis number one or they have overlying hep C or hep B in a non-cirrhotic liver with chronic inflammation. So it's very, very low. I don't screen my patients unless they have cirrhosis. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Y'all have a good afternoon. Oh, sure. Yeah.